great to see such a crowd here. Thank you all for being here. I'm Jeff Mackey Mason. I'm the university librarian at Berkeley. Thank you for coming to our library book talk. It's a delightful, cheerful California day out there, and uh, I can see why you're all inside. I'm going to be very brief because, of course, you're here to hear Dacher and Michael, not me. Uh, Dr. Keltner is a professor of psychology at Berkeley. He's the founder and faculty director of the Greater Good Science Center. His research focuses on the biological and evolutionary origins of human feelings and behaviors that don't immediately serve obvious evolutionary purposes, things like compassion, awe, love, beauty. Think about that for a minute and try to tell yourself an evolutionary story about that and then read Doctor's work, which includes over 190 published scientific articles and five books. Uh, an interesting fact I learned about Dasher is that he was raised in Laurel Canyon in the late 1960s, which I think is a topic for yet another pre presentation. <laughs> I'm sure there are a few, few stories there, a few stories there. Michael Pollan is one of the best known writers and activists on food and diet in America, and that's saying a lot when we're sitting at the alma mater and the home base of Alice Waters. Uh, Michael, there's no way to summarize his work and his accomplishments briefly, so I'm just going to mention a couple of tidbits. His book, Omnivore's Dilemma, was one of, named one of the 10 best books of 2006 by both the New York Times and the Washington Post. There have been three documentaries made based on his books that have been shown on Netflix and PBS. He was awarded the Lenin Ono Grand Prize for Peace by Yoko Ono in 2010. And as if it weren't impressive enough to be a journalism professor at Berkeley, he is simultaneously a professor at Harvard. Try, try to duplicate that one. Uh, today, today, together, they're going to be discussing Michael's most recent book, How to Change Your Mind, which is actually not quite about food, uh, but about mind-altering substances that you might ingest, such as magic mushrooms and LSD. Dr. and Michael, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very good to be here on home, home ground and with Dacker, who is uh, a, a close friend as well as an interlocutor. And this is, I think, the third or fourth time we've sat down <laughs> to talk about this book. So he's been uh, very patient. Yeah, no, and it's, we're laughing about how, and I've had the pleasure of knowing Michael for quite some time. And when you go visit a restaurant with Michael Pollan, the you know, sous chef comes out with a tattered copy and like, would you sign this? And there's cranberry sauce all over it. And, and after this book, people come up to Michael like, hey. Yes. <laughs> so I hope you're not doing that tonight. And, uh, and that was my daughter who was here. And I'm glad she was kicked out of here. Because I know anyway. So, um, so what uh, we thought we would do is um, take about 35 minutes. And I have some questions for Michael. Um, I have uh, uh, selected a few different passages that I think would be really good for Michael to read. I know this is a, this being Berkeley, it's going to be a very. How many of you have read the book? Amazing. So you're going to have a lot of questions. Uh, so and then we'll have 20, 25 minutes of um, uh, your your questions and your observations, and uh, hopefully not too many experiences in that realm. And then. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course you can. Uh, and then Michael will be selling, signing books over there. Um, I guess I wanted to start with the beginning. And um, uh, a lot of people go out and take psychedelics uh, and then start writing uh, and think they're onto something really big. Uh, and you had a lot of hesitation about this book and trepidation and took a lot to dive into this topic. And, just curious yeah, I was, uh, I was uh, really not experienced yeah. uh, when I undertook this. My first big psychedelic experience, I was in my late 50s already, I think. Um, I didn't do psychedelics at the age-appropriate time. Um, for a couple of reasons, uh, I was afraid of them. Um, I had, uh, you know, in, in, I was born in 1955, and by the time it, it was something I would seriously consider, by the time I was in my late teens, the, the moral panic uh, against psychedelics was in full flower. Yeah. And you were hearing these terrifying stories yeah. about you know, the trip from which someone never came back and uh, um, the uh, uh, kids staring at the sun until they went blind on LSD. And uh, so it, it sounded really scary. And I also didn't feel psychologically sturdy enough to withstand the kind of assault on the ego that 
was in store. So it took me a long time. And even as a elder psychonaut, um, <laughs> I was a very reluctant one. And, um, and you know, I did seven <laughs> trips for this book, I would uh -huh. say. And, uh, and, and the night before every one was kind of a sleepless night of yeah. ping-ponging arguments back and forth. Are you crazy? You're going to go up on this mountain with this guy you barely know who doesn't even have a telephone, and you're going to take LSD, and like you could have a heart attack. And is he going to call 911? He can't even call 911. <laughs> and then on the other hand, the other side is, wow, but it could be so interesting. And you do have a book to write. And <laughs> so in every, I mean, I realized later that the, the voice arguing caution and summoning all the these rational arguments was um, my ego trying to defend itself from the uh, uh, you know what I had planned for it and um, but in each case I managed to get over my reluctance and and uh, and surrender to the experience which is really what it takes so yeah so it didn't it didn't come easy I mean it was and I felt obligated to do it at a certain point I mean yes I was curious but I also felt I couldn't write a book on the subject without having experienced it and and written about it from inside. Yeah. Um, so there was no question when I started out that I would be doing this. 2006, an important year in sort of the renaissance and getting mm. you into this and what's, what's happening and who are some of the characters yeah. that kind well, of brought you into this? You know, there's a, there, is, there is this modern renaissance going on that I think people are now aware of, but, um, but it really starts in like 1999 when uh, Johns Hopkins starts right. their mystical experience study. Uh, that's when Johns Hopkins University, you know, one of the most prestigious medical schools in the, in the world, uh, does this kind of whacked study, like seeing if, if psilocybin can occasion mystical experiences in healthy, normal people. Um, no medical application, uh, and, um, and so that study, when it's published in 2006, um, was a big deal. Yeah. And a couple things happened in 2006. There was also a Supreme Court decision that um, the uh, ayahuasca churches, yeah. the UDV, and, um, uh, could, under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, could uh, use ayahuasca as a sacrament um, in, in the United States. And, and the third thing that happens there is the 100th birthday of Albert Hoffman, the inventor or discoverer of LSD. And uh, it's very rare that at, some, at the centennial of someone's birth, that person is there speaking, <laughs> and he was. He, was uh, he lived to be 102, uh, allegedly taking microdoses of LSD to the end, um, but I haven't confirmed that. Like uh, Aldous Huxley. And, and standing yeah. on his head every day. That was another thing he did. <laughs> Um, so if you want the prescription for long life, there we have it. Uh, uh, and that became a kind of gathering of the tribe and, uh -huh. and, and, and the energy to kind of bring back this research uh, really surfaces in 2006. I don't hear about this, though, till um, 2013 or so, um, when I hear about a study going on at NYU and Johns Hopkins that builds on that 2016 study that found that, indeed, in two-thirds of the cases, a high dose of, of psilocybin will occasion a mystical experience characterized by ego dissolution and a sense of meaning and all these kind of things. And, uh, and that that experience has such positive effects on people's psychology that they tried uh, administering it to people with cancer diagnoses, many of them terminal to see if this would help them, help relieve their fear and anxiety. And in, uh, again, in two thirds of the cases, when people had that big mystical experience, it did completely change their attitudes toward their death. And uh, I, I interviewed people who, who'd had this, uh, almost a conversion experience, yeah. and with a lot of spiritual uh, overtones, um, but people who completely lost their fear of death yeah. uh, based on one experience. And, and figuring out what that was about was yeah. something that drove me to want to try the, try the drugs as well. I want to ask you later and um, sort of get your reflections on it because it's, it's both at the heart of the book and we're going to launch into a few of your personal experiences and have you read, but how did you approach it as a writer? I mean, you're heading into these kind of for you personally untraveled areas of your mind. Yeah. These are experiences that by definition may not be amenable to language, right? And yeah, to, no, I had, so I had, I mean, 
I was very nervous about the, um, that was the other thing I was nervous about, was the writing of it. I yeah. mean, here were these experiences that, you know, William James had told us were ineffable, and I was going to try to F them. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and how do you do that? And, um, and, and did, you I take, wanted, did you have a, what, I mean, did you take notes as you went through? No. Or, no. I, I tried. One time I tried taking notes. Uh, it just doesn't work. I, I told my guides. So in every, it's very important to understand that the, with one exception, the experiences I had were substantially different than, the, than what may be in people's head as a you know, psychedelic experience, which is you know, unsupervised, on your own, uh, out in nature. These are guided uh, psychedelic experiences. I was trying to the extent I could to simulate what was going on in these trials, these drug trials at, yeah. at Hopkins and NYU and UCLA. And um, so in all those cases, there, is, uh, there are two guides or therapists who prepare you very carefully for the experience in advance, qualify you for it, you know, make sure you don't have uh, predilection to psychosis and things like that, personality disorder. Um, then they, and they, they give you some very good advice on how to deal with difficulties that might arise. Um, you know, if you see something terrifying, don't try to get away from it go toward it, um, surrender, whatever's happening. If you feel yourself going mm. crazy or dying or your ego dissolving, go with it. And, and surrender is a very important yeah. premise because yeah. you, you can't resist what's going on in your mind anyway. And, um, but if you do surrender, it, it tends to break through that darkness to a much more um, potentially ecstatic Amazing. place. Yeah. Um, so they give you this preparation, and then they sit with you uh, during the, the whole experience. They say very little. They're just available to you. You're wearing eye shades and listening to music. Um, and that seems weird to people who have psychedelic experience, because yeah. you're, you're blocking out a lot of sensory information. Um, and the, and the, the thinking there is to, um, that it should be internal, uh, that you should be, this is, this is a psychological treatment, and that you should go deep into your own uh, history um, and, and and not be um, dazzled and distracted by you know the fireworks going on, um, which as soon as you take them off, fireworks do happen, <laughs> um, and that's very interesting because when you take when you take one sense offline, the brain fills that vacuum with all sorts of interesting things. Uh -huh. um, and the music, too, is very important, yeah. uh, synesthesia. What, I mean, the experience of music is like nothing I've, I'd ever had. And then after the experience, and they're there to just kind of like, if you get hungry or need to go to the bathroom, you know, but they, they, they're very non-interventionist. So I did ask my guides to take notes uh -huh. on anything I said, <laughs> which was completely useful. It was like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Spectacular, and there were a couple gnomic utterances. I think you like, pulled off in the beginning. There was a note, or <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I also another one I said is uh, I, I I don't want to be so stingy with my feelings, or something like that. You got a reaction over there. Was, uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there were a couple lines that yeah. I actually did make it into the uh -huh. book. But basically, I the way I recorded the experience is the night uh, the night after. It's very chaotic, it's yeah. very inchoate. Yeah. And so making sense of it, I would first t tell the narrative to my wife over, to Judith over dinner. And then I would sit down and write everything I could remember. And it would be like this 25 page single space wow. thing. Wow. And that's what I would work with when I sat down to write. Unfortunately, when I looked at that, when I sat down to write, it was like crazy and, and not of any literary quality at all. <laughs> um, Anyway, and then the last thing the guides do, just to fill in the picture of the guided experience, is they help you integrate the experience. Right. They, they, you sit with them, talk about what happened, because they don't know, and, um, and see if there aren't any lessons or, or uh, ideas you can apply to the conduct of your life. Um, and that integration is very, very important. Yeah. Many people have had psychedelic experiences, especially as kids, that they just dismiss as, oh, that was the LSD. <laughs> but of course, it's not the LSD. <laughs> It's, everything is a product of your mind. It's mind in your life. Yeah, I mean, there's no consistency across these experiences. It's not like the phenomenology of cocaine or, or right. the opiates, which is very consistent across the population. This is, a, as, as one um, psychiatrist put it, an unspecific mental amplifier. Yeah. And so yep. it, is, it does bear scrutiny, and, um, but that didn't always happen. So that's very useful. Anyway, long answer to your question. 
Let's turn to a few narratives as the grist for our mill. Um, and I, what, it, what, for those of you who haven't read the book, what's wonderful about the book is, is Michael's typical kind of conceptual analysis, which is cultural history is blended with politics, is blended with science, is blended with the first person experience. And by the time you're having this experience, uh, it has all these systems in play that are uh, producing these experiences. So maybe you can tell us just that kind of story for each of these experiences. So we'll start with Azzy's, your experience with the Azzy tea with Judith. And uh, yeah. okay. why Azzy's? And, so, and then read this passage. Well, those of you who know my work know I'm very interested in natural history. And uh, in Botany of Desire, I wrote a book about uh, our engagement with four plants and how they change us and we change them. And I've always had the sense of that we're in a dynamic relationship with other species, which people understand with animals, but less so with plants. And I, I started writing as a gardener, and that's my passion. And um, so I wasn't going to look at this question without really looking at the natural history of psilocybin. Now, it's not a plant. It's a, a fungus. But I got very curious as to why these plants produce this amazing chemical. Uh, what's in it for them? And, um, and so I went, and I wanted to go see if I could find them. Um, and they grow in a, a surprisingly wide range of places, including, I might say, on this campus. <laughs> <laughs> I have not found them, but I was, after, after the book came out, I was eating at Bistro Liaison before they closed, and, and the wait, my waiter sidles up to me and says, you know, they're all over campus. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, where, where? <laughs> And he said, it, look at, he said, watch the wood chips. That was his, <laughs> his wisdom. But I, I would discourage anyone from taking a psilocybin mushroom they found on their own because there are lookalikes that will lead to, as the field guides say, field guides say an agonizing death. Uh, Gallerina is one in particular. So don't mess around with finding them. Um, um, you know, unless you're with somebody. So I, I went uh, and I was interviewing Paul Stamets, who's a very prominent mycologist, and he took me to hunt for um, psilocybe. There are 150 different psilocybes, um, azurescence, um, which he named for his son. He found it for the first time. He named it for his son, Azurius, who in turn was named Azurius because of the color of psilocybin. He's very into psilocybin. Uh, <laughs> and this mushroom has only been found at the mouth of the Columbia River. Uh, in, in a, and there's a couple state parks there. And I'm not at liberty to tell you which one where we found it. So we went hunting uh, for a couple days in, in November many years ago. And we found a very small number of what he says are the most powerful psilocybin mushroom. And I said, why aren't they more? Uh, commonly used. And he said, well, they have a side effect some people don't like. I said, what's that? Temporary paralysis. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, we found some. And uh, I had an experience on them. I did not get paralyzed. And, um, uh, and this was before I worked with any guides. And I was in my garden. Of my, we have a house in New England uh, where we used to live. And um, I, you know, as you know, I, I've, I've always believe that plants have their own subjectivity. I don't mean they have self-consciousness yeah. or anything, but they have a, they have a point of view, and, and co-evolution takes two, yeah. and um, there's a kind of agency there that I've written about. So that was an intellectual conceit for me, um, very useful in, in writing that book, but what was amazing about this experience was how it became a, a felt reality. So this paragraph, I'll read it in this copy, one, three, four. Um, is toward the end of this experience, which was um, a very powerful experience of nature. So I was walking around in my garden, and I was, I was out at my, this little building I built um, a long time ago, and then I'm walking back toward the end. My walk back to the house was, I think, the peak of the experience. It comes back to me now in the colors and tones of a dream. There was, again, the sense of pushing my body through a mass of air that had been sweetened by flocks and was teeming, almost frenetic with activity. So it's late August. It's, it's hot. The air is thick. Um, and it's uh, getting near dusk. The dragonflies, big as birds, were now out in force, touching down just long enough to kiss the flocks blossoms and then lift off before madly crisscrossing the garden path. 
These were more dragonflies than I had ever seen in one place, so many, in fact, that I wasn't completely sure if they were real. Judith later confirmed the sighting when I got her to come outside. And as they executed their flight, flight patterns, they left behind them contrails that persisted in the air, or so at least it appeared. Dusk now approaching, the air traffic in the garden had built to a riotous crescendo. The pollinators making their last rounds of the day, the plants still signifying to them with their flowers, me, me, me. In one, in one way, I knew this scene well, the garden coming briefly back to life after the heat of a summer day has relented, but never had I felt so integral to it. I was no longer the alienated human observer gazing at the garden from a distance, whether literal or figural, but rather felt part and parcel of all that was transpiring here. So the flowers were addressing me as much as the pollinators, and perhaps because the very air that afternoon was such a felt presence, one's usual sense of oneself as a subject observing objects in space, objects that have been thrown into relief and rendered discreet by the apparent void that surrounds them, gave way to a sense of being deep inside and fully implicated in this scene, one more being in relation to the myriad other beings into the whole. Everything, this is a quote from von Humboldt, the great naturalist, 18th century naturalist, everything is inter interaction and reciprocal, wrote von Humboldt, and this felt very much the case, and so for the first time I can remember did this, and this is another quote from him, I myself am identical with nature. And I had never felt that, no. I had never felt fully implicated in nature. I'd always had that human remove, and, uh, and that, was a, that was a thrilling moment. Yeah, yeah. amazing. So let's move on to LSD. Um, tell us about your experience there. So there, that was the first uh, guided experience I had um, with a, a man that, um, so there's an underground, right? Yeah. I mean, I couldn't participate in the above ground. Uh, they didn't want a journalist, or, they, or I didn't qualify. They were not treating healthy normals, which I flatter myself thinking that was my category. <laughs> um, but they were treating you know, smoking addicts and uh, depressives and all sorts of people that I didn't qualify. So I did the next best thing, which is find my way into this underground. And it's a surprisingly vibrant group of people. Um, many of them are actually trained therapists who do this because they really believe it works at great personal risk. Some of them are charlatans, too, so you can't generalize entirely, and, um, and some of them are somewhere in the middle. Um, and I interviewed several people, um, and some of them I just would not entrust my mind to. And, um, <laughs> but I found this very unlikely guy <laughs> that I did, and, um, and I say unlikely because he was, he was German-born, he was the son of a Nazi, he had a <laughs> raging alcoholic father, and uh, came here at the height of the 60s and kind of reinvented himself and lives on a mountain uh, you know, off, entirely off the grid. The person I was describing worrying about having a heart attack on his property was, is him. I call him Fritz in the book. And, um, and so with him, I had my first LSD experience. Um, it was not transformative. Um, for various reasons, uh, I, it wasn't a very high dose. It was like 150 micrograms, and, but it was really interesting. And it was very kind of psychoanalytic. Uh, it was just, I was lying there and, and just a parade of, of loved ones kept coming mm. like one after another. I mean, reviewing all my relationships with all these people in my life. And, um, and, uh, and they were very vivid to me. And, um, and the takeaway, and this is where we get into the ineffable issue, was um, a cliche, which was that I felt with this powerful conviction I had never had before <laughs> that love is the most important thing in the universe. Man, that now, is deep. No, no, it's deep. <laughs> You can look at it two ways. No, I'm with you, you can put that on a Hallmark card. <laughs> it is true, but it's also true. Yeah. <laughs> and so how do you get that across in a piece of writing? Um, yeah. uh, you know, the, the banality, the line between banality and profundity is quite fine. Um, so that was one of my struggles. And, and part of the way I dealt with these kind of struggles was deciding, I'm just going to level with the reader. I'm going to break the fourth wall and say, I've got this problem. I had this feeling, but I know, I know how it sounds. 
And, uh, and I do that repeatedly. So there's a brief passage where I talk about love in that section. Yeah. Is that the one you want me to yeah. read? Yeah, I think what it's on. That? It's going to be right there. 251. Um, yeah, so here's where I had that line. I don't want to be so stingy with my feelings. And, and then another quote that he wrote down, all this time spent worrying about my heart. What about all the other hearts in my life? There's a background to that, which is I had had this episode of like a weird heart rhythm during doing a preliminary exercise with this guy. That's why the dose was fairly small. It embarrasses me to write these words. They sound so thin, so banal. This is a failure of my language, no doubt, but perhaps it is not only that. Psychedelic experiences are notoriously hard to render in words. To try is necessarily to do violence to what has been seen and felt, which is in some fundamental way pre- or post-linguistic, or as students of mysticism say, ineffable. Emotions arrive in all their newborn nakedness, unprotected from the harsh light of scrutiny, and especially the pitiless glare of irony. Platitudes that would seem out of place, that wouldn't seem out of place on a Hallmark card, glow with the force of revealed truth. Love is everything. OK, but what else did you learn? No, you must not have heard me. It's everything. Is a platitude so deeply felt still just a platitude? No, I decided. A platitude is precisely what is left of a truth after it has been drained of all emotion. To resaturate that dried husk with feeling is to see it again for what it is the loveliest and most deeply rooted of truths hidden in plain sight. A spiritual insight? Maybe so. Or at least that's how it appeared in the middle of my journey. Psychedelics can make even the most cynical of us into fervent evangelists of the obvious. You could say the medicine makes you stupid, but after my journey through what must sound like a banal and sentimental landscape, I don't think that's it. For what, after all, is the sense of banality or the ironic perspective if not two of the sturdier defenses the adult ego deploys to keep from being overwhelmed by our emotions, certainly, but perhaps also by our senses, which are liable at any time to astonish us with news of the sheer wonder of the world. If we are ever to get through the day, we need to put most of what we perceive into, into boxes neatly labeled known, to be quickly shelved with little thought to the marvels therein, and novel to which, understandably, we pay more attention, at least until it isn't that anymore. A psychedelic is liable to take all the boxes off the shelf, open and remove even the most familiar items, turning them over and imaginatively scrubbing them until they shine once again with the light of first sight. It is this reclassification of, is this reclassification of the familiar a waste of time? If it is, then so is a lot of art. It seems to me there is great value in such renovation, the more so as we grow older and come to think we've seen and felt it all before. So that's the, that's the line you're walking here. And it's, it's, as a writer, it's kind of challenging. Yeah. Um, so I, I just erred for directness and you know, talking directly to the, to, the, to the reader about these challenges. As you're moving through these trips, um, what's happening to your mind? What's that, what, what, how are you changing? How are you thinking about? The contents of your mind. Well, I'm um, I'm becoming more open to to weirdness than I was. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a kind of a fervent materialist, <laughs> and uh, my outlook is shaped very much by my reading of science. And uh, and I, I'm I'm not a very or I wasn't a very spiritual person. Um, but here, these things are happening that are like raising all sorts of very interesting questions. And, um, and the world is appearing somewhat different than I thought. And I'm not sure how much to credit it. I mean, the subjectivity of these plants that I felt, yeah. is that a data point of any value? And, or is that just a projection of an idea already held? So, uh, so I'm definitely opening things up over the course of it. Um, and then I had an experience that was um, uh, that was transformative. Mm. Um, and this, this happened um, on psilocybin, a, a high dose psilocybin with a guide uh, on the East Coast, uh, a woman. And, um, and this, you know, I, I started out as a pretty, you know, I say a spiritually underdeveloped person in the book. And, and this experience kind of changed my understanding of what's, what the word spiritual means, at least to me. And this experience um, was, 
started out kind of badly. Um, there was a piece of music she was playing. Music becomes, because of synesthesia, music kind of creates your world, when you have, especially when you have eye shades on. And she put on this piece of music by a man named Thierry David, who's a new age composer, who I learned later was thrice nominated for best chill groove album. <laughs> <laughs> and this music would have been fine if you were like getting a massage at the Claremont, maybe. Um, but exploring the depths of your soul, it was, it was like so awful. And, and, it, and it created a landscape in my head um, that was black and white and computer generated and it was like some video game environment because it sounded like it was electronic music. When I listened listen to it later, it actually wasn't. Um, but, um, and I was stuck in this place. I was stuck in it for a really long time. And I asked her to change the music and I couldn't get out of it. And finally I said, look, I need a break. I have to uh, you know, use the bathroom. And so I take off my, my, um, my eye shades and like, Wow, like everything is jeweled with diamonds in this room, and, but it, I'm, I'm restored to this beautiful reality. And, and um, Mary, as I call her in the book, helps me get up. I'm a little wobbly and get to the bathroom, and I'm, I'm very careful not to look in the mirror. That's like someone had warned me of that. And, um, they said, beware of trip face. <laughs> which, which, okay, so I didn't look in the mirror, and. Uh, I peed and produced this spectacular crop of diamonds. <laughs> and, and then made my way out uh, and back. And, and Mary asked, do you want a booster dose? Because I hadn't taken all I was going to take. And I was, yeah, maybe that'll change things. And this really weird thing happened at that moment, which is um, she, she kind of squats down next to me. I'm lying on this futon on the, on the floor. And she's holding out this mushroom. And I look at her, and she's been transformed. And she's turned into, uh, she's, she's kind of blonde and Nordic with hair part, parted in the middle, long blonde hair and high cheekbones. And, and, but now she had black hair, this leathery brown skin, and her hands were wrinkled. And like she was this uh, Mexican peasant. She was a, a Mazatec Indian and in, in a white dress. And I didn't want to tell her what had happened to her. Um, but I knew exactly. <laughs> I knew exactly who it was. She had become Mary Sabina, who's this legendary figure and this uh, indigenous um, American in, in uh, Oaxaca who had given uh, Gordon Wasson, the first Westerner to try psilocybin in 1956, his first trip. And he'd been searching the world for these mushroom cults and found them in the middle of nowhere. And so she's she's a very important figure. And she had, and uh, Mary had turned into Maria Sabina. I take the extra, I take the additional mushroom and uh, go back under, and, uh, and then this incredible thing happens after about 20 minutes, um, and that is I, I kind of look up, and I see myself, and my, and my self, my ego, has kind of like exploded in a little cloud of post-it notes, <laughs> like a hundred, a cloud of a hundred post-it notes, and I look, and that's me. And now I look, who's that? Well, this other perspective opened up, and um, I didn't know what that was. It was completely untroubled by this catastrophe, <laughs> and it was like, yes, you're now Post-it Notes. <laughs> and, um, and I was calm, and, um, and it was a, this wonderful um, perspective that I'd never had, that, and I still don't know what it is. Yeah. Huxley would have said that was like mind at large, some universal consciousness. I don't know. Um, and then I looked again, and I was no longer post-it notes, but I was um, a coat of, of paint, just kind of this thin coat of paint spread over the landscape. It's it the most amazing thing. Um, and, uh, and it was as things should be. I was fine with it. And with myself gone, what happens is there's no break between subject and object. Yeah. So whatever you experience, you become. And in my case, we finally agreed on a piece of music, and she puts on this Bach unaccompanied cello suite, uh, number two in D minor, if you want to listen to it sometime. It's a, a, an amazing piece of music. It's the saddest piece of music, I think, in the repertoire. Mm. And it's so beautiful, and I had heard it at funerals, and, um, and I merged with this piece of music. Mm. Um, there was no difference between me and it. I could feel Yo-Yo Ma's bow going over my skin and, uh, and, and then was inside the well of space looking out. 
And it was um, just the most profound experience of, of music that I'd ever had. And, it, and it, it was ecstatic in the sense of I was not in my body, but not happy, because it was all death imagery. All the imagery was, was uh, you know, um, the, the piece is just all about death. But in the way that I felt about death, the way I felt about turning into confetti, it was fine. I was reconciled. So it was a... Um, it was an amazing experience, and um, it, I, I said that, rather than read, I think I'll just yeah. talk this out, um, yeah. I said that it changed my take on, um, on what spiritual means, at least for me, in that um, I realized what happens when you let go of the ego is that walls come down and you have this profound connection. Um, that your ego has been defending you against. Whether that is love for members of your family or for the universe or for this piece of music, but it's, it's really characterized by love and connection. And that it is the ego that stands in the way. But that powerful connection, which for some people might take on um, you know, the coloring of divinity or God, for me it was music, universe, mm -hmm. love, people in my life. Um, that that's what spiritual experience is, that powerful connectedness. And, and the ego is, is, is what walls us from that, um, perhaps because it's too powerful to feel all the time, but, but it definitely goes overboard. And so instead of thinking the opposite term for spiritual is material, as I had assumed, I, I came to understand after that experience that the the, and, and the fact that there was another ground on which to stand as a human, that, you, that you're not identical to your ego, which I think most of us assume, um, that you can lose that, but yeah. you don't die. You don't disappear. So that the real opposite for spiritual, in my mind now, is egotistical. And that's what we have to work on. Yeah. And that's, a, you know, that's, a, that's an individual issue, and that's a social issue right now, right? I mean, yeah. we are... The ego objectifies the other, and that's, that's what's happening now, um, whether the other is nature or other people. Um, so that's what I came out of that experience with. And that was, a, for me, that was a, that was a powerful takeaway. And, and I owe it to this gnarly mushroom. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I mean, I mean it's striking. That's obviously the heart of mysticism. And it's also um, a, a very present thought right now in a lot of evolutionary science is that there are these selfless states that are genetically encoded that produce emotions like compassion, which runs throughout your book. Yeah. Um, before we open it up to the audience. Yeah, the I ego is also adaptive in its own way, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, 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 obviously we evolved an ego too, yeah. because it helps us get shit done. But that, <laughs> every now and then. Yeah, yeah so. every now and then. Um, we're gonna, have a micro room. we're gonna have a microphone circulate, but I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions since you and I have uh, had these conversations since May. Uh, with the release of the book. I have been astonished at the liberating effect of this book. And I know you've been surprised. Uh, drug books don't sell well, for the most part. This one did really well. They often are ignored by critics. Um, and I find I've taught some of the content of this in my human happiness class here at Berkeley. Uh, it frees up people to tell stories that they've been dying to tell. Yeah. Um, What's your sense of the reaction to this book as you've traveled around? Well, it's been kind of, uh, it's been astonishing. I mean, you know, I, I really didn't, I mean, people know how to buy a book on food, right? We've all done it a few times now. And, um, but how many people, general readers who aren't psychonauts, have bought a book on psychedelics? And my publisher had, you know, worries about that, and I had worries about that. Um, but um, it turns out that there's a lot more interest than I thought, that there is a, there is a, there's been this sub rosa conversation around psychedelics uh, on university campuses, but not only there, in religious institutions, yeah. in psychiatry departments, um, and that I think in some ways this book licensed that conversation to come out. I mean, I've been invited to do grand rounds in, in uh, medical schools and psychiatry departments and telling Dacker I'm going to speak at the American Psychological Association in August. I mean, these are not the people I thought would be open to this message. Some of that has to do with um, the fact that drug war is losing steam, I think. Some of it has to do with the fact that some of this research is really interesting that's been published. Um, and it's very high quality research. And it's showing 
benefits not only for the dying, but people with depression, people with addiction, people with obsessive uh, compulsive disorder. Um, and some of it is, frankly, the desperation of the mental health uh, community for some new tools. And that, you know, I, I didn't know, I had never written about mental health and uh, mental illness before, but um, it's a mess. It's just a mess. I mean, if you compare mental health care to any other branch of medicine now, um, they have very little to show for themselves. If you compare it to cardiology or oncology or infectious disease that have actually lengthened lifespans and reduced suffering in dramatic ways, you can't say that about our treatment of depression or schizophrenia or anything. So, so there, and the SSRIs that were really the last big innovation um, in the late 80s and early 90s um, are kind of losing steam and not working for lots of people. So there's a, there's a hunger for some new tools and an openness to look at something as out of the box as psychedelics. So that's been a real surprise to me. Yeah. Um, and that a lot of mainstream medical schools yeah. and psychiatry departments are uh, about to start research. I mean, there's gonna be a eight site depression study starting this, um, this summer and uh, Yale's gonna participate and UCSF is gonna participate and Hopkins and NYU and um, you know, top ranked places are taking this very seriously. So, you know, I, I don't take credit for any of this. This was on its way. I mean, writers don't change the zeitgeist. They kind of might speed things up a little bit. I mean, we're not, what we're good at as journalists, if we're good at is kind of like being a very short-term visionary. You know, if you're, if you're a long-term visionary as a journalist, you will not succeed. No one will know what you're talking about. Um, so, so maybe we can see around one corner. Uh -huh. And something in the air made me think that psychedelics would, yeah. was uh, something to think about and work on. But um, yeah, I've been, I've been really surprised. Um, the other thing that has surprised me, I mean, a question I was asked the other day was, um, you know, what is it like going from being the food guy to the psychedelic guy? <laughs> And um, it's a lot easier being the food guy. Um, as you were saying, the food guy, you know, gets an extra dessert in certain <laughs> restaurants. And the psychedelic guy gets hundreds of requests for referrals to psychedelic therapists, <laughs> which are not funny. They're actually, like, so sad and so moving. Um, stories of people who have a suicidal relative or an alcoholic parent and and see this as a, as a hope. And it's not available yet. And to, to, you know, it's a fateful step to, to seek help underground. And, and people do need to understand, we haven't talked about the risks, but they're real risks to these drugs. And um, they tend to be more psychological than biological, um, but they're real. And um, they're not for everybody. So this unmet need for, um, for, for therapeutic help uh, and people looking to change their minds is um, much more profound and powerful than I thought, and it's very moving to, to, to touch that current feeling that's out there. Yeah, definitely has. Let's move to some questions from all of you uh, or observations. So we have a microphone, and raise your hand if you have a question about how to change your mind in Michael's book, and we'll start with you. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Your book is truly very beautiful. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about if you had anxiety or you were nervous to publish about an experience that's fundamentally illegal, illegal? especially in such a compelling way. Yeah, I did. I mean, I was nervous about it, and I had the book very carefully lawyered. Um, and I, I was less worried about myself. I mean, maybe I was worried about some reputational harm that might come, but um, in terms of that I would be arrested, um, I learned that, that my confessions, so-called, are not really admissible because you can't tell where I was or when this happened, um, which are two, if you're ever going to write about this, those are the two things to disguise. Um, I was more concerned about my guides, though, that I would, you know, that some prosecutor would decide we have to make an example of this community of guides. And um, so I, I took a lot of precautions to protect them. The facts about their lives are true, but the, the, also where they are and their real names and, and when we work together is all hidden. Um, 
But I was nervous about that. I was also nervous about people who would get into trouble doing what I was describing. And, and I still am nervous about that. Um, that, you know, uh, that if demand for psychedelic therapy spiked, there would be people getting into that space, calling themselves psychedelic therapists who might be frauds. And, and that, you know, is no doubt happening. Um, and just to talk about risk a little bit more, um, there, you know, there was a big survey done of, of uh, people who've used psychedelics, not in, in, in all different settings. And, and it's interesting to see that group, about 8% of them sought psychiatric help as a result of a difficult experience on psychedelics. So that, that risk is real, 7.8%. Um, on the other hand, on balance, the people who used psychedelics were, had better mental health um, scores than, than the average person. Now that could be because they were sturdy enough to do it on the, you know, to begin with, it could mean a lot of different things, but less suicide, less depression, that kind of stuff. Um, but the risks are um, some people at risk for schizophrenia will have a psychotic break or can have a psychotic break. Would they have had it anyway? Some people say yes, some people say no. Um, but they're non-addictive and they're less toxic than many of the drugs in your medicine cabinet that you bought over the counter. I mean, Tylenol, for example. Tylenol kills a lot of people at, at pretty small doses. Um, but the risks are psychological. So, so people have to, you know, it's a big step. It's a big step, and people shouldn't be casual about it. And, and I, you know, I don't want um, I, I to create a, a fad for doing something that, you know, is, it's a big life decision. Right here. Thank you um, for the book, and uh, thank you for your research over all of your career, uh, both very inspiring. So um, when you were uh, being measured by Judson Brewer with the EEG cap, you did a couple of meditations. Uh, the second one was loving kindness, and then the third, you recalled your experience, one of your psychedelic experiences, and ended up, I believe, kind of going way below baseline. Mm. And the question that I have for you is, have you been doing that kind of thing subsequently, and what is it like? And then the other question that I have for both of you is, you know, um, I'm thinking of like Tanya Singer's work on kind of new forms of meditation practice or mindfulness practice. How much possibility do you think there is that humanity hasn't even yet begun to discover in this space? Oh, God, a lot. Well, I mean, just to frame, I mean, it's such an interesting question because uh, what we're learning from Tanya Singer in Europe and lots of neuroscientists, Robin Carhart Harris, is the neurological underpinnings of awe, which hadn't been studied, compassion, um, ecstasy, uh, the loss of self. So I think that these are new structures that hadn't been thought of before, and it's a great Petri dish, if you will. You are the, in the Petri dish. Yeah. Uh, to well, I, this out. I think that's kind of the, the, the one of the interesting things about psychedelics is okay, there's the therapeutic, there's the spiritual, yeah. but then there is the kind of, these are probes of consciousness yeah. and, and really interesting tools, Ooh. really interesting tools that um, I hope can be used not just in this therapeutic context, um, but to understand the self as, a, as this construct. Uh, so what you're referring to, probably what he said made very little sense to those of you who hadn't read the book. Um, I'll try to fill you in. But Judson Brewer is a, um, a psychiatrist and neuroscientist who works on meditation, not psychedelics. Um, and he, uh, when the first uh, brain scans of people on psychedelics were published, um, they showed this very interesting pattern of activity, or rather lack of activity, which is this one particular brain network, the default mode network, which is this midline set of tightly linked structures that connect the cortex to the posterior cingulate cortex and, um, uh, and deeper centers of emotion and um, memory, uh, is to their surprise is, is, is uh, muffled. Uh, activity goes way down, and they, they expected to see activity throughout the brain going way up on psychedelics. Judson Brewer is at Yale studying meditation, and he's, and he's also scanning the brains of people who are very experienced meditators while they're meditating, and he's getting the same scan. The same activities are, um, uh, the, the same parts of the brain are diminished in activity, this default mode network. 
So um, he developed a kind of neural feedback EEG that you wear, it's like this bathing cap you put on, and it's focused not on the whole default mode network, but on the posterior cingulate cortex, which is, uh, what happens in the default mode network is a lot of what are called metacognitive processes. You, uh, it's, it's where you, where self-reflection and self-criticism takes place. It's where the narrative, the story you tell yourself about who you are is constructed and, and, and you know, reconciled with stuff happening in your life. Uh, it's where time travel takes place. You, you imagine the, the future and the past. So it's, it's, it's very much the seat of the ego and, um, or the self to the extent that, you know, that has an address. So the posterior singular cortex is specifically involved in the narrative self. Um, taking, so if, if I say to you, here's a list of adjectives, you know, uh, friendly, angry, patriotic, da 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 um, and you it just I ask you to read them, you won't, it won't light up your posterior cingulate cortex. But if I say, think about how those adjectives apply or don't apply to you, it'll go crazy. So it's where you kind of like connect yourself and your story. So I put on this thing that measures activity in this structure, the PCC, and we did these various things like meditation to see if we could diminish it, and, um, and it did to some extent. I'm not a very experienced meditator. But then I asked him as an experiment, I, I want to try something. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Um, and I went into, in my mind, one of my psychedelic experiences and specifically dwelling on this interesting image I had had that I didn't understand on ayahuasca. Um, and that was that I was in a, I was caged. It was kind of a dark image at first. Um, I was wearing these very tight eye shades and the, 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 the strings became bars, black bars, and they, and they moved down my body until I was like trapped in this cage of black steel and a very paranoid moment. And then I looked down and I saw a little shoot, a vine, two leaves starting to grow. And then it grows up uh, using this cage to get higher and higher and reach the sunlight. And then it bursts out and I was like, wow, you can cage animals, but you can't cage plants. And I kept saying that over to myself. I don't know what it means, I still don't. It's a visual koan. People have sent me suggestions. Um, but I thought about that, I just focused on that. And that brought back the mental state in which I'd had it, which was a very diminished uh, default mode network. So I thought that was really interesting. There are so many cool experiments that could be done. Yeah. And um, you know, I hope they happen on this campus at some point. In your department. Indeed. Uh, quick follow-up. There was a second piece to the question, which is interesting, which is the, you know, the intersection between psychedelic experiences and then all the new interest in contemplative science and contemplative practice. And, and awe. And awe and Buddhist practice and the like. What, yeah. what do you think about that? Well, there, there are interesting links. Um, I don't know if you, you realize, but uh, if you scratch an American Buddhist now, um, you know, one of the leaders of that, of that movement, uh, you will find a former psychonaut. Um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty common, the Jack Kornfelds of the world and the Joan Halifaxes. And um, uh, these people got into contemplative practice after having some powerful psychedelic experiences. And, and I can really understand this, if you wanna take the, the, the modes of consciousness you're exploring and turn them into a practice, you know, you're not gonna take psychedelics every day. You're gonna start meditating. It, it's, there's an organic flow from one to the other. And Judson Brewer, who, as I said, works on meditation, um, although he, he's had psychedelic experience, um, he thinks someday we may help people begin a contemplative practice with a psychedelic experience, which is an interesting idea. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's years away when it's all you know, legal again. Okay. We have time for two, three more questions? Yes, standing up. Thank you. Um, so you did some very kind of like obscure methods of psychedelic experience, obviously the rare mushroom. I believe you talked about like frog venom that had DMT in it. Mm -hmm. So I was curious, how was it that you decided um, on which substances you were gonna use? And also, were each of the seven trips kind of planned together initially, or was it more like one just organically led to the next? Yeah. So, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, some of it was, I mean, 
I didn't plan that carefully. I, 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 I planned around the guides for the most part, and, and they tend to have a specialty. They have, you know, it's, most of the guides don't work with LSD, actually, because I think it takes too long. You know, it's a long trip. Um, but I found this one who did, and, that's, and that was the medicine he liked best. So, so I was influenced by that. In the case of the obscure one you mentioned, 5-MeO-DMT, um, which is the smoked venom of the Sonoran Desert Toad. <laughs> who figured that out, right? Um, <laughs> points for our species, huh? <laughs> um, that was just an opportunity that presented itself, you could say. <laughs> Although it was not a happy experience. Um, that was my most, my darkest experience. Um, this is a very powerful, it's not the same as DMT, even though DMT is in the name, although it's similar in the sense that it's very fast acting. It doesn't last, it's only, the best thing about this trip is it's only 20 minutes long. Um, but it's, a, it's a, just a horrifying, terrifying 20 minutes. Wow. At least it was for me. I mean, other people have had good experiences. Um, and then ayahuasca um, was the other one that I used. Uh, I, I mean, I did a couple ayahuasca circles, with, you know, which is a group experience, which is different, changes things. Um, in general, I think the psychedelics have more in common than not, with the exception of the 5-MeO-DMT. Um, ayahuasca is a much more, does feel like a more bodily process, because you feel this, you're drinking this liquid, and it's very thick, and that doesn't taste good, and it's, you know, causing upset as it goes through your stomach, and you really do feel like there's a vine going through your body. Um, so it's a more physical experience than some of the others. Um, but I think they have more in common than not. Where's the mic? Um, yeah, in general, uh, first I just wanted to say thank you for being a very great writer. Oh, God, thanks. <laughs> and, <laughs> Uh, my question is, you have a note in the book talking about your experiences before engaging in this project as a whole in talking in front of large crowds of people and doing it, say, from a state of competence and confidence and the idea of going through these experiences through this book of kind of breaking that down. So now that you've had these psychedelic experiences and wrote this book. How do you feel talking in front of large groups of people now? For example, right here. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I mean, you, you put yourself in a very vulnerable place doing these, doing these substances. And, um, and I did feel very vulnerable. And the scene you're describing is I went uh, in the course of 24 hours from giving a lecture on a stage in, uh, I'm not going to say the city, because it would disclose where this guy lived. Um, in front of like 2,000 people and then talking about food and then the next day I'm on my back, you know, tripping my brains out uh, with this guy. <laughs> and that, that, that juxtaposition was, um, you know, I've had to get comfortable talking about it and talking about my experiences. This is, look, this is a very personal book. It's a very personal topic. I'm talking about things very close to me. Um, and... Uh, so that's, you know, I write, and I've always written in the first person. I've, you know, written a half dozen books in the first person. But it's not the most confessional first person. You don't actually learn that much about me, you know. Um, I use the first person as a narrative device more than a, to talk about myself. And this book, I, it would have been, I couldn't have written it without talking in a more personal way. So I have gotten comfortable it's taken me a little while, but I mean, I have spoken about this book and talked about some of my trips on, you know, much larger stages than this. Um, and I, you know, I'm getting back something that makes it doable. If I weren't, if people were like thinking, why is that maniac up there <laughs> telling me about his trips, but that I'm, that I'm able to connect with people, whether they've had this experience or not, is, makes me feel I can be open about it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely new territory for me. And, and that to me is what this whole project has been about. I mean, one of the things I love about journalism, we haven't talked about journalism. This is journalism of a, of a kind, and that's what I teach here on campus. Um, but that journalism allows you, uh, as opposed to being an academic, to learn a completely new subject and get paid to do it late in life. 
And, um, and so I knew nothing about neuroscience. I knew very little about psychology. I knew uh, very little about pharmacology, nothing. And here I was, you know, with this rich new topic that was so exciting. And, um, and I was learning not only about the brain, I was learning about my mind, I was learning about natural history of mushrooms, and, um, and that's what I love about doing journalism, um, that I, I didn't have to continue to write books about food because we're not expected to as journalists necessarily. You know, we, can, we, can, we have a freedom of movement. Um, and so that was a great, that was a great blessing. And, um, and to, to embark on a new topic, and this all started when I was approaching 60 and uh, was so exciting. Um, to have a you know a whole different shelf of books to read, um, and uh, so for me that was the best part was the novelty of both the experience of doing the drugs, but also the experience of researching the subject. So, Michael, I wanted to, I think we're probably at time, but I have good news for you, Michael and I. But Michael will be sell, signing books over here. You can ask him your yeah, questions. Yeah, please bring your questions over there. Yeah. Um, on behalf of this audience, I wanted to. Just say how lucky we are to have Michael Pollan in our midst. Uh, he starts game-changing conversations about food and uh, the psyche and the mind and, and this, this book. Um, this book will change your mind. Uh, the greatest uh, expression of approval came from my daughter who stole it from me and I was reading it. And I saw her comments and I was like, this is amazing, I want that. This is, Dad needs more of this, right? <laughs> Uh, it changed her mind as it will change yours, so thank you so much. Let me much. just say one other thing, too, is that, you know, Dacker um, listened to me talk about this book, and we, we, we spent a lot of time hiking in Tilden Park, and there, he and another member of his department, Allison Gottnick, were just really key people in helping me understand uh, the psychology of awe and emotion in general, the ego, and so... One of the great things about being a journalist on a campus like this is those kind of resources. So thank you, Dad. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>